Section one of Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom by William and Ellen Craft. Preface Having heard while in slavery that god made of one blood all nations of men and also that the american declaration of independence says that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness we could not understand by what right we were held as chattels therefore we felt perfectly justified in undertaking the dangerous and exciting task of running a thousand miles in order to obtain those rights which are so vividly set forth in the declaration i beg those who would know the particulars of our journey to peruse these pages this book is not intended as a full history of the life of my wife nor of myself but merely as an account of our escape together with other matter which i hope may be the means of creating in some minds a deeper abhorrence of the sinful and abominable practice of enslaving and brutifying our fellow-creatures without stopping to write a long apology for offering this little volume to the public I shall commence at once to pursue my simple story. W. Craft, 12 Cambridge Road, Hammersmith, London. End of section 1section 2 of Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom by Ellen and William Craft. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Segment A God gave us only over beast, fish, fowl, dominion absolute, that right we hold by his donation. But man over man he made not lord, such title to himself reserving, human left from human free. Milton my wife and myself were born in different towns in the state of georgia which is one of the principal slave states it is true our condition as slaves was not by any means the worst but the mere idea that we were held as chattels and deprived of all legal rights the thought that we had to give up our hard earnings to a tyrant to enable him to live in idleness and luxury the thought that we could not call the bones and sinews that god gave us our own but above all the fact that another man had the power to tear from our cradle the new-born babe and sell it in the shambles like a brute and then scourge us if we dared to lift a finger to save it from such a fate haunted us for years but in december eighteen forty eight a plan suggested itself that proved quite successful and in eight days after it was first thought of we were free from the horrible trammels of slavery rejoicing and praising god in the glorious sunshine of liberty my wife's first master was her father and her mother his slave and the latter is still the slave of his widow notwithstanding my wife being of african extraction on her mother's side she is almost white in fact she is so nearly so that the tyrannical old lady to whom she first belonged became so annoyed at finding her frequently mistaken for a child of the family that she gave her when eleven years of age to a daughter as a wedding present this separated my wife from her mother and also from several other dear friends but the incessant cruelty of her old mistress made the change of owners or treatment so desirable 
that she did not grumble much at this cruel separation it may be remembered that slavery in america is not at all confined to persons of any particular complexion there are a very large number of slaves as white as any one but as the evidence of a slave is not admitted in court against a free white person it is almost impossible for a white child after having been kidnapped and sold into or reduced to slavery in a part of the country where it is not known as often is the case ever to recover its freedom i have myself conversed with several slaves who told me that their parents were white and free but that they were stolen away from them and sold when quite young as they could not tell their address and also as the parents did not know what had become of their lost and dear little ones of course all traces of each other were gone the following facts are sufficient to prove that he who has the power and is inhuman enough to trample upon the sacred rights of the weak cares nothing for race or colour in march eighteen eighteen three ships arrived at new orleans bringing several hundred german emigrants from the province of alsace on the lower rhine among them were daniel muller and his two daughters dorothea and salome whose mother had died on the passage soon after his arrival muller taking with him his two daughters both young children went up the river to atacapus parish to work on the plantation of john f miller a few weeks later his relatives who had remained at new orleans learned that he had died of the fever of the country they immediately sent for the two girls but they had disappeared and the relatives notwithstanding repeated and persevering inquiries and researches could find no traces of them they were at length given up for dead dorothea was never again heard of nor was anything known of salome from eighteen eighteen till eighteen forty three in the summer of that year madame karl a german woman who had come over in the same ship with the mullers was passing through a street in new orleans and accidentally saw salome in a wine-shop belonging to louis belmont by whom she was held as a slave madame karl recognized her at once and carried her to the house of another german woman mrs schubert who was salome's cousin and godmother and who no sooner set eyes on her than without having any intimation that the discovery had been previously made she unhesitatingly exclaimed my god here is the long-lost salome muller the law reporter in its account of this case says as many of the german emigrants of eighteen eighteen as could be gathered together were brought to the house of mrs schubert and every one of the number who had any recollection of the little girl upon the passage or any acquaintance with her father and mother immediately identified the woman before them as the long-lost salome muller by all these witnesses who appeared at the trial the identity was fully established the family resemblance in every feature was declared to be so remarkable that some of the witnesses did not hesitate to say that they should know her among ten thousand that they were as certain the plaintiff was salome muller the daughter of daniel and dorothea muller as of their own existence among the witnesses who appeared in court was the midwife who had assisted at the birth of salome she testified to the existence of certain peculiar marks upon the body of the child which were found exactly as described by the surgeons who were appointed by the court to make an examination for the purpose there was no trace of african descent in any feature of salome muller she had long straight black hair hazel eyes thin lips and a roman nose the complexion of her face and neck was as dark as that of the darkest brunette it appears however that during the twenty-five years of her servitude she had been exposed to the sun's rays in the hot climate of louisiana with head and neck unsheltered as is customary with the female slaves while labouring in the cotton or the sugar-field 
those parts of her person which had been shielded from the sun were comparatively white belmont the pretended owner of the girl had obtained possession of her by an act of sale from john f miller the planter in whose service salome's father died this miller was a man of consideration and substance owning large sugar estates and bearing a high reputation for honour and honesty and for indulgent treatment of his slaves it was testified on the trial that he had said to belmont a few weeks after the sale of salome that she was white and had as much right to her freedom as any one and was only to be retained in slavery by care and kind treatment the broker who negotiated the sale from miller to belmont in eighteen thirty eight testified in court that he then thought and still thought that the girl was white the case was elaborately argued on both sides but was at length decided in favour of the girl by the supreme court declaring that she was free and white and therefore unlawfully held in bondage the rev george bourne of virginia in his picture of slavery published in eighteen thirty four relates the case of a white boy who at the age of seven was stolen from his home in ohio tanned and stained in such a way that he could not be distinguished from a person of colour and then sold as a slave in virginia at the age of twenty he made his escape by running away and happily succeeded in rejoining his parents i have known worthless white people to sell their own free children into slavery and as there are good-for-nothing white as well as coloured persons everywhere no one perhaps will wonder at such inhuman transactions particularly in the southern states of america where i believe there is a greater want of humanity and high principle amongst the whites than among any other civilised people in the world i know that those who are not familiar with the working of the peculiar institution can scarcely imagine any one so totally devoid of all natural affection as to sell his own offspring into returnless bondage but shakespeare that great observer of human nature says with caution judge of probabilities things deemed unlikely e'en impossible experience often shows us to be true my wife's new mistress was decidedly more humane than the majority of her class my wife has always given her credit for not exposing her to many of the worst features of slavery for instance it is a common practice in the slave states for ladies when angry with their maids to send them to the calaboose sugar house or to some other place established for the purpose of punishing slaves and have them severely flogged and i am sorry it is a fact that the villains to whom these defenceless creatures are sent not only flog them as they are ordered but frequently compel them to submit to the greatest indignity oh if there is any one thing under the wide canopy of heaven horrible enough to stir a man's soul and to make his very blood boil it is the thought of his dear wife his unprotected sister or his young and virtuous daughters struggling to save themselves from falling a prey to such demons it always appears strange to me that any one who was not born a slaveholder and steeped to the very core in the demoralizing atmosphere of the southern states can in any way palliate slavery it is still more surprising to see virtuous ladies looking with patience upon and remaining indifferent to the existence of a system that exposes nearly two millions of their own sex in the manner i have mentioned and that too in a professedly free and christian country there is however great consolation in knowing that god is just and will not let the oppressor of the weak and the spoiler of the virtuous escape unpunished here and hereafter i believe a similar retribution to that which destroyed sodom 
is hanging over the slaveholders. My sincere prayer is that they may not provoke God by persisting in a reckless course of wickedness to pour out his consuming wrath upon them. End of section two. Section three of Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom by Ellen and William Craft. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part one, segment B. I must now return to our history. My old master had the reputation of being a very humane and Christian man, but he thought nothing of selling my poor old father and dear aged mother at separate times to different persons, to be dragged off never to behold each other again, till summoned to appear before the great tribunal of heaven. But oh, what a happy meeting it will be on that great day for those faithful souls, I say a happy meeting, because I never saw persons more devoted to the service of God than they. But how will the cause stand with those reckless traffickers in human flesh and blood, who plunged the poisonous dagger of separation into those loving hearts which God had for so many years closely joined together, nay, sealed as it were with his own hands for the eternal courts of heaven? it is not for me to say what will become of those heartless tyrants i must leave them in the hands of an all-wise and just god who will in his own good time and in his own way avenge the wrongs of his oppressed people my old master also sold a dear brother and a sister in the same manner as he did my father and mother the reason he assigned for disposing of my parents as well as of several other aged slaves was that they were getting old and would soon become valueless in the market and therefore he intended to sell off all the old stock and buy in a young lot a most disgraceful conclusion for a man to come to who made such great professions of religion this shameful conduct gave me a thorough hatred not for true Christianity, but for slave-holding piety. My old master, then, wishing to make the most of his slaves, apprenticed a brother and myself out to learn trades, he to a blacksmith, and myself to a cabinet-maker. If a slave has a good trade, he will let or sell for more than a person without one, and many slaveholders have their slaves taught trades on this account but before our time expired my old master wanted money so he sold my brother and then mortgaged my sister a dear girl about fourteen years of age and myself then about sixteen to one of the banks to get money to speculate in cotton this we knew nothing of at the moment but time rolled on the money became due my master was unable to meet his payments so the bank had us placed upon the auction stand and sold to the highest bidder my poor sister was sold first she was knocked down to a planter who resided at some distance in the country then i was called upon the stand while the auctioneer was crying the bids i saw the man that had purchased my sister getting her into a cart to take her to his home i at once asked a slave friend who was standing near the platform to run and ask the gentleman if he would please to wait till i was sold in order that i might have an opportunity of bidding her good-bye he sent me word back that he had some distance to go and could not wait i then turned to the auctioneer fell upon my knees and humbly prayed him to let me just step down and bid my last sister farewell but instead of granting me this request he grasped me by the neck and in a commanding tone of voice and with a violent oath exclaimed get up you can do the wench no good therefore there is no use in your seeing her on rising 
i saw the cart in which she sat moving slowly off and as she clasped her hands with a grasp that indicated despair and looked pitifully round towards me i also saw the large silent tears trickling down her cheeks she made a farewell bow and buried her face in her lap this seemed more than i could bear it appeared to swell my aching heart to its utmost but before i could fairly recover the poor girl was gone gone and i have never had the good fortune to see her from that day to this perhaps i should have never heard of her again had it not been for the untiring efforts of my good old mother who became free a few years ago by purchase and after a great deal of difficulty found my sister residing with a family in mississippi my mother at once wrote to me informing me of the fact and requesting me to do something to get her free and i am happy to say that partly lecturing occasionally and through the sale of an engraving of my wife in the disguise in which she escaped together with the extreme kindness and generosity of miss burdett coutts mr george richardson of plymouth and a few other friends i have nearly accomplished this it would be to me a great and ever glorious achievement to restore my sister to our dear mother from whom she was forcibly driven in early life i was knocked down to the cashier of the bank to which we were mortgaged and ordered to return to the cabinet shop where i previously worked but the thought of the harsh auctioneer not allowing me to bid my dear sister farewell sent red-hot indignation darting like lightning through every vein it quenched my tears and appeared to set my brain on fire and made me crave for power to avenge our wrongs but alas we were only slaves and had no legal rights consequently we were compelled to smother our wounded feelings and crouch beneath the iron heel of despotism i must now give the account of our escape but before doing so it may be well to quote a few passages from the fundamental laws of slavery in order to give some idea of the legal as well as the social tyranny from which we fled according to the law of louisiana a slave is one who is in the power of a master to whom he belongs the master may sell him dispose of his person his industry and his labour he can do nothing possess nothing nor acquire anything but what must belong to his master civil code article thirty five in south carolina it is expressed in the following language slaves shall be deemed sold taken reputed and judged in law to be chattels personal in the hands of their owners and possessors and their executors administrators and assigns to all intents constructions and purposes whatsoever two brevard's digest two twenty nine the constitution of georgia has the following article four section twelve any person who shall maliciously dismember or deprive a slave of life shall suffer such punishment as would be inflicted in case the like offence had been committed on a free white person and on the like proof except in case of insurrection of such slave and unless such death should happen by accident in giving such slave moderate correction prince's digest five fifty nine i have known slaves to be beaten to death but as they died under moderate correction it was quite lawful and of course the murderers were not interfered with if any slave who shall be out of the house or plantation where such slave shall live or shall be usually employed or without some white person in company with such slave shall refuse to submit 
to undergo the examination of any white person let him be ever so drunk or crazy it shall be lawful for such white person to pursue apprehend and moderately correct such slave and if such slave shall assault and strike such white person such slave may be lawfully killed two brevard's digest two thirty one provided always says the law that such striking be not done by the command and in the defence of the person or property of the owner or other person having the government of such slave in which case the slave shall be wholly excused according to this law if a slave by the direction of his overseer strike a white person who is beating said overseer's pig the slave shall be wholly excused but should the bondman of his own accord fight to defend his wife or should his terrified daughter instinctively raise her hand and strike the wretch who attempts to violate her chastity he or she shall saith the model republican law suffer death from having been myself a slave for nearly twenty-three years i am quite prepared to say that the practical working of slavery is worse than the odious laws by which it is governed at an early age we were taken by the persons who held us as property to macon the largest town in the interior of the state of georgia at which place we became acquainted with each other for several years before our marriage in fact our marriage was postponed for some time simply because one of the unjust and worse than pagan laws under which we lived compelled all children of slave mothers to follow their condition that is to say the father of the slave may be the president of the republic but if the mother should be a slave at the infant's birth the poor child is ever legally doomed to the same cruel fate it is a common practice for gentlemen if i may call them such moving in the highest circles of society to be the fathers of children by their slaves whom they can and do sell with the greatest impunity and the more pious beautiful and virtuous the girls are the greater the price they bring and that too for the most infamous purposes any man with money let him be ever such a rough brute can buy a beautiful and virtuous girl and force her to live with him in a criminal connection and as the law says a slave shall have no higher appeal than the mere will of the master she cannot escape unless it be by flight or death in endeavouring to reconcile a girl to her fate the master sometimes says that he would marry her if it was not unlawful footnote it is unlawful in the slave states for any one of purely european descent to intermarry with a person of african extraction though a white man may live with as many coloured women as he pleases without materially damaging his reputation in southern society End of footnote. however he will always consider her to be his wife and will treat her as such and she on the other hand may regard him as her lawful husband and if they have any children they will be free and well educated i am in duty bound to add that while a great majority of such men care nothing for the happiness of the women with whom they live nor for the children of whom they are the fathers there are those to be found even in that heterogeneous mass of licentious monsters who are true to their pledges but as the woman and her children are legally the property of the man who stands in the anomalous relation to them of husband and father as well as master they are liable to be seized and sold for his debts should he become involved there are several cases on record where such persons have been sold and separated for life 
i know of some myself but i have only space to glance at one end of section three Section 4 of Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom by Ellen and William Craft. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1. Segment C. I knew a very humane and wealthy gentleman that bought a woman with whom he lived as his wife. They brought up a family of children, among whom were three nearly white, well-educated, and beautiful girls on the father being suddenly killed it was found that he had not left a will but as the family had always heard him say that he had no surviving relatives they felt that their liberty and property were quite secured to them and knowing the insults to which they were exposed now their protector was no more they were making preparations to leave for a free state but poor creatures they were soon sadly undeceived a villain residing at a distance hearing of the circumstance came forward and swore that he was a relative of the deceased and as this man bore or assumed mr slater's name the case was brought before one of those horrible tribunals presided over by a second judge jeffreys and calling itself a court of justice but before whom no coloured person nor an abolitionist was ever known to get his full rights a verdict was given in favour of the plaintiff whom the better portion of the community thought had wilfully conspired to cheat the family the heartless wretch not only took the ordinary property but actually had the aged and friendless widow and all her fatherless children except frank a fine young man about twenty-two years of age and mary a very nice girl a little younger than her brother brought to the auction stand and sold to the highest bidder mrs slater had cash enough that her husband and master left to purchase the liberty of herself and children but on her attempting to do so the pusillanimous scoundrel who had robbed them of their freedom claimed the money as his property and poor creature she had to give it up according to law as will be seen hereafter a slave cannot own anything the old lady never recovered from her sad affliction at the sale she was brought up first and after being vulgarly criticised in the presence of all her distressed family was sold to a cotton planter who said he wanted the proud old critter to go to his plantation to look after the little woolly heads while their mammies were working in the field when the sale was over then came the separation and oh deep was the anguish of that slave mother's heart when called from her darlings for ever to part the poor mourning mother of reason bereft soon ended her sorrows and sank cold in death antoinette the flower of the family a girl who was much beloved by all who knew her for her christ-like piety dignity of manner as well as her great talents and extreme beauty was bought by an uneducated and drunken slave dealer i cannot give a more correct description of this scene when she was called from her brother to the stand than will be found in the following lines why stands she near the auction stand that girl so young and fair what brings her to this dismal place why stands she weeping there why does she raise that bitter cry why hangs her head with shame as now the auctioneer's rough voice so rudely calls her name but see she grasps a manly hand and in a voice so low as scarcely to be heard she says my brother must i go a moment's pause 
then midst a wail of agonizing woe his answer falls upon the ear yes sister you must go no longer can my arm defend no longer can i save my sister from the horrid fate that waits her as a slave blush christian blush for e'en the dark untutored heathen see thy inconsistency and lo they scorn thy god and thee the low trader said to a kind lady who wished to purchase antoinette out of his hands i reckon i'll not sell the smart critter for ten thousand dollars i always wanted her for my own use the lady wishing to remonstrate with him commenced by saying you should remember sir that there is a just god hoskins not understanding mrs huston interrupted her by saying i does and guess it's monstrous kind to him to send such likely niggers for our convenience mrs houston finding that a long course of reckless wickedness drunkenness and vice had destroyed in hoskins every noble impulse left him antoinette poor girl also seeing that there was no help for her became frantic i can never forget her cries of despair when hoskins gave the order for her to be taken to his house and locked in an upper room on hoskins entering the apartment in a state of intoxication a fearful struggle ensued the brave antoinette broke loose from him pitched herself head foremost through the window and fell upon the pavement below her bruised but unpolluted body was soon picked up restoratives brought doctor called in but alas it was too late her pure and noble spirit had fled away to be at rest in those realms of endless bliss where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest antoinette like many other noble women who are deprived of liberty still holds something sacred something undefiled some pledge and keepsake of their higher nature and like the diamond in the dark retains some quenchless gleam of the celestial light on hoskins fully realizing the fact that his victim was no more he exclaimed by thunder i am a used-up man the sudden disappointment and the loss of two thousand dollars was more than he could endure so he drank more than ever and in a short time died raving mad with delirium tremens the villain slater said to mrs houston the kind lady who endeavoured to purchase antoinette from hoskins nobody needn't talk to me about buying them there niggers for i'm not going to sell em but mary is rather delicate said mrs houston and being unaccustomed to hard work cannot do you much service on a plantation i don't want her for the field replied slater but for another purpose mrs houston understood what this meant and instantly exclaimed oh but she is your cousin the devil she is said slater and added do you mean to insult me madam by saying that i am related to niggers no replied mrs houston i do not wish to offend you sir but wasn't mr slater mary's father your uncle yes i calculate he was said slater but i want you and everybody to understand that i'm no kin to his niggers oh very well said mrs houston adding now what will you take for the poor girl nothing he replied for as i said before i'm not going to sell so you needn't trouble yourself no more if the critter behaves herself i'll do as well by her as any man slater spoke up boldly but his manner and sheepish look clearly indicated that his heart within him was at strife with such accursed gains for he knew whose passions gave her life whose blood ran in her veins 
the monster led her from the door he led her by the hand to be his slave and paramour in a strange and distant land poor frank and his sister were handcuffed together and confined in prison their dear little twin brother and sister were sold and taken where they knew not but it often happens that misfortune causes those whom we counted dearest to shrink away while it makes friends of those whom we least expected to take any interest in our affairs among the latter class frank found two comparatively new but faithful friends to watch the gloomy paths of the unhappy little twins in a day or two after the sale slater had two fast horses put to a large light van and placed in it a good many small but valuable things belonging to the distressed family he also took with him frank and mary as well as all the money for the spoil and after treating all his low friends and bystanders and drinking deeply himself he started in high glee for his home in south carolina but they had not proceeded many miles before frank and his sister discovered that slater was too drunk to drive but he like most tipsy men thought he was all right and as he had with him some of the ruined family's best brandy and wine such as he had not been accustomed to and being a thirsty soul he drank till the reins fell from his fingers and in attempting to catch them he tumbled out of the vehicle and was unable to get up frank and mary there and then contrived a plan by which to escape as they were still handcuffed by one wrist each they alighted took from the drunken assassin's pocket the key undid the iron bracelets and placed them upon slater who was better fitted to wear such ornaments as the demon lay unconscious of what was taking place frank and mary took from him the large sum of money that was realized at the sale as well as that which slater had so very meanly obtained from their poor mother they then dragged him into the woods tied him to a tree and left the inebriated robber to shift for himself while they made good their escape to savannah the fugitives being white of course no one suspected that they were slaves end of section four section five of running a thousand miles for freedom by ellen and william craft this librivox recording is in the public domain part one segment d slater was not able to call any one to his rescue till late the next day and as there were no railroads in that part of the country at that time it was not until late the following day that slater was able to get a party to join him for the chase a person informed slater that he had met a man and woman in a trap answering to the description of those whom he had lost driving furiously towards savannah so slater and several slave hunters on horseback started off in full tilt with their bloodhounds in pursuit of frank and mary on arriving at savannah the hunters found that the fugitives had sold the horses and trap and embarked as free white persons for new york slater's disappointment and rascality so preyed upon his base mind that he like judas went and hanged himself as soon as frank and mary were safe they endeavoured to redeem their good mother but alas she was gone she had passed on to the realm of spirit life in due time frank learned from his friends in georgia where his little brother and sister dwelt so he wrote at once to purchase them but the persons with whom they lived would not sell them 
after failing in several attempts to buy them frank cultivated large whiskers and mustachios cut off his hair put on a wig and glasses and went down as a white man and stopped in the neighbourhood where his sister was and after seeing her and also his little brother arrangements were made for them to meet at a particular place on a sunday which they did and got safely off i saw frank myself when he came for the little twins though i was then quite a lad i well remember being highly delighted by hearing him tell how nicely he and mary had served slater frank had so completely disguised or changed his appearance that his little sister did not know him and would not speak till he showed their mother's likeness the sight of which melted her to tears for she knew the face frank might have said to her oh emma oh my sister speak to me dost thou not know me that i am thy brother come to me little emma thou shalt dwell with me henceforth and know no care or want emma was silent for a space as if twere hard to summon up a human voice frank and mary's mother was my wife's own dear aunt after this great diversion from our narrative which i hope dear reader you will excuse i shall return at once to it my wife was torn from her mother's embrace in childhood and taken to a distant part of the country she had seen so many other children separated from their parents in this cruel manner that the mere thought of her ever becoming the mother of a child to linger out a miserable existence under the wretched system of american slavery appeared to fill her very soul with horror and as she had taken what i felt to be an important view of her condition i did not at first press the marriage but agreed to assist her in trying to devise some plan by which we might escape from our unhappy condition and then be married we thought of plan after plan but they all seemed crowded with insurmountable difficulties we knew it was unlawful for any public conveyance to take us as passengers without our master's consent we were also perfectly aware of the startling fact that had we left without this consent the professional slave hunters would have soon had their ferocious bloodhounds baying on our track and in a short time we should have been dragged back to slavery not to fill the more favourable situations which we had just left but to be separated for life and put to the very meanest and most laborious drudgery or else have been tortured to death as examples in order to strike terror into the hearts of others and thereby prevent them from even attempting to escape from their cruel taskmasters it is a fact worthy of remark that nothing seems to give the slaveholders so much pleasure as the catching and torturing of fugitives they had much rather take the keen and poisonous lash and with it cut their poor trembling victims to atoms than allow one of them to escape to a free country and expose the infamous system from which he fled the greatest excitement prevails at a slave hunt the slaveholders and their hired ruffians appear to take more pleasure in this inhuman pursuit than english sportsmen do in chasing a fox or a stag therefore knowing what we should have been compelled to suffer if caught and taken back we were more than anxious to hit upon a plan that would lead us safely to a land of liberty but after puzzling our brains for years we were reluctantly driven to the sad conclusion that it was almost impossible to escape from slavery in georgia and travel one thousand miles across the slave states we therefore resolved to get the consent of our owners be married settle down in slavery 
and endeavour to make ourselves as comfortable as possible under that system but at the same time ever to keep our dim eyes steadily fixed upon the glimmering hope of liberty and earnestly pray god mercifully to assist us to escape from our unjust thraldom we were married and prayed and toiled on till december eighteen forty eight at which time as i have stated a plan suggested itself that proved quite successful and in eight days after it was first thought of we were free from the horrible trammels of slavery and glorifying god who had brought us safely out of a land of bondage knowing that slaveholders have the privilege of taking their slaves to any part of the country they think proper it occurred to me that as my wife was nearly white i might get her to disguise herself as an invalid gentleman and assume to be my master while i could attend as his slave and that in this manner we might effect our escape after i thought of the plan i suggested it to my wife but at first she shrank from the idea she thought it was almost impossible for her to assume that disguise and travel a distance of one thousand miles across the slave states however on the other hand she also thought of her condition she saw that the laws under which we lived did not recognize her to be a woman but a mere chattel to be bought and sold or otherwise dealt with as her owner might see fit therefore the more she contemplated her helpless condition the more anxious she was to escape from it so she said i think it is almost too much for us to undertake however i feel that god is on our side and with his assistance notwithstanding all the difficulties we shall be able to succeed therefore if you purchase the disguise i will try to carry out the plan but after i concluded to purchase the disguise i was afraid to go to any one to ask him to sell me the articles it is unlawful in georgia for a white man to trade with slaves without the master's consent but notwithstanding this many persons will sell a slave any article that he can get the money to buy not that they sympathize with the slave but merely because his testimony is not admitted in court against a free white person therefore with little difficulty i went to different parts of the town at odd times and purchased things piece by piece except the trousers which she found necessary to make and took them home to the house where my wife resided she being a lady's maid and a favourite slave in the family was allowed a little room to herself and amongst other pieces of furniture which i had made in my overtime was a chest of drawers so when i took the articles home she locked them up carefully in these drawers no one about the premises knew that she had anything of the kind so when we fancied we had everything ready the time was fixed for the flight but we knew it would not do to start off without first getting our master's consent to be away for a few days had we left without this they would soon have had us back into slavery and probably we should never have got another fair opportunity of even attempting to escape some of the best slaveholders will sometimes give their favourite slaves a few days holiday at christmas time so after no little amount of perseverance on my wife's part she obtained a pass from her mistress allowing her to be away for a few days the cabinet maker with whom i worked gave me a similar paper but said that he needed my services very much and wished me to return as soon as the time granted was up i thanked him kindly but somehow i have not been able to make it convenient to return yet and as the free air of good old england agrees so well with my wife and our dear little ones as well as with myself 
it is not at all likely we shall return at present to the peculiar institution of chains and stripes on reaching my wife's cottage she handed me her pass and i showed mine but at that time neither of us were able to read them it is not only unlawful for slaves to be taught to read but in some of the states there are heavy penalties attached such as fines and imprisonment which will be vigorously enforced upon any one who is humane enough to violate the so-called law End of section 5section six of running a thousand miles for freedom by ellen and william craft this librivox recording is in the public domain part one segment e the following case will serve to show how persons are treated in the most enlightened slaveholding community indictment commonwealth of virginia norfolk county s s in the circuit court the grand jurors empanelled and sworn to inquire of offences committed in the body of the said county on their oath present that margaret douglas being an evil disposed person not having the fear of god before her eyes but moved and instigated by the devil wickedly maliciously and feloniously on the fourth day of july in the year of our lord one thousand eight hundred and fifty four at norfolk in said county did teach a certain black girl named kate to read in the bible to the great displeasure of almighty god to the pernicious example of others in like case offending contrary to the form of the statute in such case made and provided and against the peace and dignity of the commonwealth of virginia victor vagabond prosecuting attorney on this indictment mrs douglas was arraigned as a necessary matter of form tried found guilty of course and judge scalawag before whom she was tried having consulted with dr adams ordered the sheriff to place mrs douglas in the prisoner's box when he addressed her as follows margaret douglas stand up you are guilty of one of the vilest crimes that ever disgraced society and the jury have found you so you have taught a slave girl to read in the bible no enlightened society can exist where such offences go unpunished the court in your case do not feel for you one solitary ray of sympathy and they will inflict on you the utmost penalty of the law in any other civilized country you would have paid the forfeit of your crime with your life and the court have only to regret that such is not the law in this country the sentence for your offence is that you be imprisoned one month in the county jail and that you pay the costs of this prosecution sheriff remove the prisoner to jail on the publication of these proceedings the doctors of divinity preached each a sermon on the necessity of obeying the laws the new york observer noticed with much pious gladness a revival of religion on dr smith's plantation in georgia among his slaves while the journal of commerce commended this political preaching of the doctors of divinity because it favoured slavery let us do nothing to offend our southern brethren however at first we were highly delighted at the idea of having gained permission to be absent for a few days but when the thought flashed across my wife's mind that it was customary for travellers to register their names in the visitors book at hotels as well as in the clearance or custom house book at charleston south carolina it made our spirits droop within us so while sitting in our little room upon the verge of despair all at once my wife raised her head and with a smile upon her face which was a moment before bathed in tears said 
i think i have it i asked what it was she said i think i can make a poultice and bind up my right hand in a sling and with propriety ask the officers to register my name for me i thought that would do it then occurred to her that the smoothness of her face might betray her so she decided to make another poultice and put it in a white handkerchief to be worn under the chin up the cheeks and to tie over the head this nearly hid the expression of the countenance as well as the beardless chin the poultice is left off in the engraving because the likeness could not have been taken well with it on my wife knowing that she would be thrown a good deal into the company of gentlemen fancied that she could get on better if she had something to go over the eyes so i went to a shop and bought a pair of green spectacles this was in the evening we sat up all night discussing the plan and making preparations just before the time arrived in the morning for us to leave i cut off my wife's hair square at the back of the head and got her to dress in the disguise and stand out on the floor i found that she made a most respectable-looking gentleman my wife had no ambition whatever to assume this disguise and would not have done so had it been possible to have obtained our liberty by more simple means but we knew it was not customary in the south for ladies to travel with male servants and therefore notwithstanding my wife's fair complexion it would have been a very difficult task for her to have come off as a free white lady with me as her slave in fact her not being able to write would have made this quite impossible we knew that no public conveyance would take us or any other slave as a passenger without our master's consent this consent could never be obtained to pass into a free state my wife's being muffled in the poultices etc furnished a plausible excuse for avoiding general conversation of which most yankee travellers are passionately fond there are a large number of free negroes residing in the southern states but in georgia and i believe in all the slave states every coloured person's complexion is prima facie evidence of his being a slave and the lowest villain in the country should he be a white man has the legal power to arrest and question in the most inquisitorial and insulting manner any coloured person male or female that he may find at large particularly at night and on sundays without a written pass signed by the master or some one in authority or stamped free papers certifying that the person is the rightful owner of himself if the coloured person refuses to answer questions put to him he may be beaten and his defending himself against this attack makes him an outlaw and if he be killed on the spot the murderer will be exempted from all blame but after the coloured person has answered the questions put to him in a most humble and pointed manner he may then be taken to prison and should it turn out after further examination that he was caught where he had no permission or legal right to be and that he has not given what they term a satisfactory account of himself the master will have to pay a fine on his refusing to do this the poor slave may be legally and severely flogged by public officers should the prisoner prove to be a free man he is most likely to be both whipped and fined the great majority of slaveholders hate this class of persons with a hatred that can only be equalled by the condemned spirits of the infernal regions they have no mercy upon nor sympathy for any negro whom they cannot enslave they say that god made the black man to be a slave for the white and act as though they really believed that all free persons of colour 
are in open rebellion to a direct command from heaven and that they the whites are god's chosen agents to pour out upon them unlimited vengeance for instance a bill has been introduced in the tennessee legislature to prevent free negroes from travelling on the railroads in that state it has passed the first reading the bill provides that the president who shall permit a free negro to travel on any road within the jurisdiction of the state under his supervision shall pay a fine of five hundred dollars any conductor permitting a violation of the act shall pay two hundred and fifty dollars provided such free negro is not under the control of a free white citizen of tennessee who will vouch for the character of said free negro in a penal bond of one thousand dollars the state of arkansas has passed a law to banish all free negroes from its bounds and it came into effect on the first day of january eighteen sixty every free negro found there after that date will be liable to be sold into slavery the crime of freedom being unpardonable the missouri senate has before it a bill providing that all free negroes above the age of eighteen years who shall be found in the state after september eighteen sixty shall be sold into slavery and that all such negroes as shall enter the state after september eighteen sixty one and remain there twenty-four hours shall also be sold into slavery for ever mississippi kentucky and georgia and in fact i believe all the slave states are legislating in the same manner thus the slaveholders make it almost impossible for free persons of colour to get out of the slave states in order that they may sell them into slavery if they don't go if no white persons travelled upon railroads except those who could get someone to vouch for their character in a penal bond of one thousand dollars the railroad companies would soon go to the wall such mean legislation is too low for comment therefore i leave the villainous acts to speak for themselves but the dred scott decision is the crowning act of infamous yankee legislation the supreme court the highest tribunal of the republic composed of nine judge jeffreys chosen both from the free and slave states has decided that no coloured person or persons of african extraction can ever become a citizen of the united states or have any rights which white men are bound to respect that is to say in the opinion of this court robbery rape and murder are not crimes when committed by a white upon a coloured person judges who will sneak from their high and honourable position down into the lowest depths of human depravity and scrape up a decision like this are wholly unworthy the confidence of any people i believe such men would if they had the power and were it to their temporal interest sell their country's independence and barter away every man's birthright for a mess of pottage well may thomas campbell say united states your banner wears two emblems one of fame alas the other that it bears reminds us of your shame the white man's liberty in types stands blazoned by your stars but what's the meaning of your stripes they mean your negro scars end of section six section seven of running a thousand miles for freedom by ellen and william craft this librivox recording is in the public domain part one segment f when the time had arrived for us to start we blew out the lights knelt down and prayed to our heavenly father mercifully to assist us as he did his people of old to escape from cruel bondage 
and we shall ever feel that god heard and answered our prayer had we not been sustained by a kind and i sometimes think special providence we could never have overcome the mountainous difficulties which i am now about to describe after this we rose and stood for a few moments in breathless silence we were afraid that some one might have been about the cottage listening and watching our movements so i took my wife by the hand stepped softly to the door raised the latch drew it open and peeped out though there were trees all around the house yet the foliage scarcely moved in fact everything appeared to be as still as death i then whispered to my wife come my dear let us make a desperate leap for liberty but poor thing she shrank back in a state of trepidation i turned and asked what was the matter she made no reply but burst into violent sobs and threw her head upon my breast this appeared to touch my very heart it caused me to enter into her feelings more fully than ever we both saw the many mountainous difficulties that rose one after the other before our view and knew far too well what our sad fate would have been were we caught and forced back into our slavish den therefore on my wife's fully realising the solemn fact that we had to take our lives as it were in our hands and contest every inch of the thousand miles of slave territory over which we had to pass it made her heart almost sink within her and had i known them at that time i would have repeated the following encouraging lines which may not be out of place here the hill though high i covet to ascend the difficulty will not me offend for i perceive the way to life lies here come pluck up heart let's neither faint nor fear better though difficult the right way to go than wrong though easy where the end is woe however the sobbing was soon over and after a few moments of silent prayer she recovered her self-possession and said come william it is getting late so now let us venture upon our perilous journey we then opened the door and stepped as softly out as moonlight upon the water i locked the door with my own key which i now have before me and tiptoed across the yard into the street i say tiptoed because we were like persons near a tottering avalanche afraid to move or even breathe freely for fear the sleeping tyrants should be aroused and come down upon us with double vengeance for daring to attempt to escape in the manner which we contemplated we shook hands said farewell and started in different directions for the railway station i took the nearest possible way to the train for fear i should be recognised by some one and got into the negro car in which i knew i should have to ride but my master as i will now call my wife took a longer way round and only arrived there with the bulk of the passengers he obtained a ticket for himself and one for his slave to savannah the first port which was about two hundred miles off my master then had the luggage stowed away and stepped into one of the best carriages but just before the train moved off i peeped through the window and to my great astonishment i saw the cabinet maker with whom i had worked so long on the platform he stepped up to the ticket seller and asked some question and then commenced looking rapidly through the passengers and into the carriages fully believing that we were caught i shrank into a corner turned my face from the door and expected in a moment to be dragged out the cabinet maker looked into my master's carriage but did not know him in his new attire and as god would have it before he reached mine the bell rang and the train moved off 
i have since heard that the cabinet-maker had a presentiment that we were about to make tracks for parts unknown but not seeing me his suspicions vanished until he received the startling intelligence that we had arrived safely in a free state as soon as the train had left the platform my master looked round in the carriage and was terror-stricken to find a mr cray an old friend of my wife's master who dined with the family the day before and knew my wife from childhood sitting on the same seat the doors of the american railway carriages are at the ends the passengers walk up the aisle and take seats on either side and as my master was engaged in looking out of the window he did not see who came in my master's first impression after seeing mr cray was that he was there for the purpose of securing him however my master thought it was not wise to give any information respecting himself and for fear that mr cray might draw him into conversation and recognize his voice my master resolved to feign deafness as the only means of self-defence after a little while mr cray said to my master it is a very fine morning sir the latter took no notice but kept looking out of the window mr cray soon repeated this remark in a little louder tone but my master remained as before this indifference attracted the attention of the passengers near one of whom laughed out this i suppose annoyed the old gentleman so he said i will make him hear and in a loud tone of voice repeated it is a very fine morning sir my master turned his head and with a polite bow said yes and commenced looking out of the window again one of the gentlemen remarked that it was a very great deprivation to be deaf yes replied mr cray and i shall not trouble that fellow any more this enabled my master to breathe a little easier and to feel that mr cray was not his pursuer after all the gentlemen then turned the conversation upon the three great topics of discussion in first-class circles in georgia namely niggers cotton and the abolitionists my master had often heard of abolitionists but in such a connection as to cause him to think that they were a fearful kind of wild animal but he was highly delighted to learn from the gentlemen's conversation that the abolitionists were persons who were opposed to oppression and therefore in his opinion not the lowest but the very highest of god's creatures without the slightest objection on my master's part the gentleman left the carriage at gordon for milledgeville the capital of the state we arrived at savannah early in the evening and got into an omnibus which stopped at the hotel for the passengers to take tea i stepped into the house and brought my master something on a tray to the omnibus which took us in due time to the steamer which was bound for charleston south carolina soon after going on board my master turned in and as the captain and some of the passengers seemed to think this strange and also questioned me respecting him my master thought i had better get out the flannels and opadeldock which we had prepared for the rheumatism warm them quickly by the stove in the gentleman's saloon and bring them to his berth we did this as an excuse for my master's retiring to bed so early while at the stove one of the passengers said to me buck what have you got there opadeldock sir i replied i should think it's up a devil said a lanky swell who was leaning back in a chair with his heels upon the back of another and chewing tobacco as if for a wager it stinks enough to kill or cure twenty men away with it or i reckon i will throw it overboard it was by this time warm enough so i took it to my master's berth remained there a little while and then went on deck and asked the steward where i was to sleep he said there was no place provided for coloured passengers whether slave or free so i paced the deck till a late hour 
then mounted some cotton bags in a warm place near the funnel sat there till morning and then went and assisted my master to get ready for breakfast he was seated at the right hand of the captain who together with all the passengers inquired very kindly after his health as my master had one hand in a sling it was my duty to carve his food but when i went out the captain said you have a very attentive boy sir but you had better watch him like a hawk when you get on to the north he seems all very well here but he may act quite differently there i know several gentlemen who have lost their valuable niggers among them damned cut-throat abolitionists before my master could speak a rough slave dealer who was sitting opposite with both elbows on the table and with a large piece of broiled fowl in his fingers shook his head with emphasis and in a deep yankee tone forced through his crowded mouth the words sound doctrine captain very sound he then dropped the chicken into the plate leant back placed his thumbs in the armholes of his fancy waistcoat and continued i would not take a nigger to the north under no consideration i have had a deal to do with niggers in my time but i never saw one who had his heel upon free soil that was worth a damn now stranger addressing my master if you have made up your mind to sell that ere nigger i am your man just mention your price and if it isn't out of the way i will pay for him on this board with hard silver dollars this hard-featured bristly bearded wire-headed red-eyed monster staring at my master as the serpent did at eve said what do you say stranger he replied i don't wish to sell sir i cannot get on well without him you will have to get on without him if you take him to the north continued this man for i can tell ye stranger as a friend i am an older cove than you i have seen lots of this here world and i reckon i have had more dealings with niggers than any man living or dead i was once employed by general wade hampton for ten years in doing nothing but breaking him in and everybody knows that the general would not have a man that didn't understand his business so i tell ye stranger again you had better sell and let me take him down to orleans he will do you no good if you take him across mason's and dixon's line he is a keen nigger and i can see from the cut of his eye that he is certain to run away my master said i think not sir i have great confidence in his fidelity fid devil indignantly said the dealer as his fist came down upon the edge of the saucer and upset a cup of hot coffee in a gentleman's lap as the scalded man jumped up the trader quietly said don't disturb yourself neighbour accidents will happen in the best of families it always makes me mad to hear a man talking about fidelity in niggers there isn't a damned one on em who wouldn't cut sticks if he had half a chance end of section seven section eight of running a thousand miles for freedom by ellen and william craft this librivox recording is in the public domain part one segment g by this time we were near charleston my master thanked the captain for his advice and they all withdrew and went on deck where the trader fancied he became quite eloquent he drew a crowd around him and with emphasis said captain if i was the president of this mighty united states of america the greatest and freest country under the whole universe i would never let no man i don't care who he is take a nigger into the north and bring him back here filled to the brim as he is sure to be with damned abolition vices to taint all quiet niggers with the hellish spirit of running away these air cap'n my flat-footed every-day right up and down sentiments and as this is a free country cap'n i don't care who hears em for i am a southern man every inch on me to the backbone good said an insignificant-looking individual of the slave dealer stamp three cheers for john c calhoun and the whole fair sunny south added the trader 
so off went their hats and out burst a terrific roar of irregular but continued cheering my master took no more notice of the dealer he merely said to the captain that the air on deck was too keen for him and he would therefore return to the cabin while the trader was in the zenith of his eloquence he might as well have said as one of his kit did at a great filibustering meeting that when the american eagle gets one of his mighty claws upon canada and the other into south america and his glorious and starry wings of liberty extending from the atlantic to the pacific oh then where will england be ye gentlemen i tell ye she will only serve as a pocket handkerchief for jonathan to wipe his nose with on my master entering the cabin he found at the breakfast-table a young southern military officer with whom he had travelled some distance the previous day after passing the usual compliments the conversation turned upon the old subject niggers the officer who was also travelling with a man-servant said to my master you will excuse me sir for saying i think you are very likely to spoil your boy by saying thank you to him i assure you sir nothing spoils a slave so soon as saying thank you and if you please to him the only way to make a nigger toe the mark and to keep him in his place is to storm at him like thunder and keep him trembling like a leaf don't you see when i speak to my ned he darts like lightning and if he didn't i'd skin him just then the poor dejected slave came in and the officer swore at him fearfully merely to teach my master what he called the proper way to treat me after he had gone out to get his master's luggage ready the officer said that is the way to speak to them if every nigger was drilled in this manner they would be as humble as dogs and never dare to run away the gentleman urged my master not to go to the north for the restoration of his health but to visit the warm springs in arkansas my master said he thought the air of philadelphia would suit his complaint best and not only so he thought he could get better advice there the boat had now reached the wharf the officer wished my master a safe and pleasant journey and left the saloon there were a large number of persons on the quay waiting the arrival of the steamer but we were afraid to venture out for fear that some one might recognize me or that they had heard that we were gone and had telegraphed to have us stopped however after remaining in the cabin till all the other passengers were gone we had our luggage placed on a fly and i took my master by the arm and with a little difficulty he hobbled on shore got in and drove off to the best hotel which john c calhoun and all the other great southern fire-eating statesmen made their headquarters while in charleston on arriving at the house the landlord ran out and opened the door but judging from the poultices and green glasses that my master was an invalid he took him very tenderly by one arm and ordered his man to take the other my master then eased himself out and with their assistance found no trouble in getting up the steps into the hotel the proprietor made me stand on one side while he paid my master the attention and homage he thought a gentleman of his high position merited my master asked for a bedroom the servant was ordered to show a good one into which we helped him the servant returned my master then handed me the bandages and i took them downstairs in great haste and told the landlord my master wanted two hot poultices as quickly as possible he rang the bell the servant came in to whom he said run to the kitchen and tell the cook to make two hot poultices right off for there is a gentleman upstairs very badly off indeed in a few minutes the smoking poultices were brought in i placed them in white handkerchiefs and hurried upstairs went into my master's apartment shut the door and laid them on the mantelpiece as he was alone for a little while he thought he could rest a great deal better with the poultices off however it was necessary to have them to complete the remainder of the journey i then ordered dinner 
and took my master's boots out to polish them while doing so i entered into conversation with one of the slaves i may state here that on the sea coast of south carolina and georgia the slaves speak worse english than in any other part of the country this is owing to the frequent importation or smuggling in of africans who mingle with the natives consequently the language cannot properly be called english or african but a corruption of the two the shrewd son of african parents to whom i referred said to me say brother where you come from and which side you go in day with dat er little done up buckra white man i replied to philadelphia what he exclaimed with astonishment to philomadelphi yes i said by squash i wish i was going with you i hears em say dat there's no slaves way over in dem parts is em so i quietly said i have heard the same thing well continued he as he threw down the boot and brush and placing his hands in his pockets strutted across the floor with an air of independence gore almighty dem is de parts for pompey and i hope when you get there you will stay and never follow dat buckra back to dis hot quarter no more let him be eber so good i thanked him and just as i took the boots up and started off he caught my hand between his two and gave it a hearty shake and with tears streaming down his cheeks said god bless you brother and may de lord be wid you when you gets de freedom and sittin under your own wine and fig tree don't forget to pray for poor pompey i was afraid to say much to him but i shall never forget his earnest request nor fail to do what little i can to release the millions of unhappy bondmen of whom he was one at the proper time my master had the poultices placed on came down and seated himself at a table in a very brilliant dining-room to have his dinner i had to have something at the same time in order to be ready for the boat so they gave me my dinner in an old broken plate with a rusty knife and fork and said here boy you go in the kitchen i took it and went out but did not stay more than a few minutes because i was in a great hurry to get back to see how the invalid was getting on on arriving i found two or three servants waiting on him but as he did not feel able to make a very hearty dinner he soon finished paid the bill and gave the servants each a trifle which caused one of them to say to me your massa is a big bug meaning a gentleman of distinction he is the greatest gentleman that has been dis way for dis six months i said yes he is some pumpkins meaning the same as big bug when we left macon it was our intention to take a steamer at charleston through to philadelphia but on arriving there we found that the vessels did not run during the winter and i have no doubt it was well for us they did not for on the very last voyage the steamer made that we intended to go by a fugitive was discovered secreted on board and sent back to slavery however as we had also heard of the overland mail route we were all right so i ordered a fly to the door had the luggage placed on we got in and drove down to the custom-house office which was near the wharf where we had to obtain tickets to take a steamer for wilmington north carolina when we reached the building i helped my master into the office which was crowded with passengers he asked for a ticket for himself and one for his slave to philadelphia this caused the principal officer a very mean-looking cheese-coloured fellow who was sitting there to look up at us very suspiciously and in a fierce tone of voice he said to me boy do you belong to that gentleman i quickly replied yes sir which was quite correct the tickets were handed out and as my master was paying for them the chief man said to him i wish you to register your name here sir and also the name of your nigger and pay a dollar duty on him my master paid the dollar and pointing to the hand that was in the poultice requested the officer to register his name for him this seemed to offend the high-bred south carolinian 
he jumped up shaking his head and cramming his hands almost through the bottom of his trousers pockets with a slave bullying air said i shan't do it this attracted the attention of all the passengers just then the military officer with whom my master travelled and conversed on the steamer from savannah stepped in somewhat the worse for brandy he shook hands with my master and pretended to know all about him he said i know his kin friends like a book and as the officer was known in charleston and was going to stop there with friends the recognition was very much in my master's favour the captain of the steamer a good-looking jovial fellow seeing that the gentleman appeared to know my master and perhaps not wishing to lose us as passengers said in an off-hand sailor-like manner i will register the gentleman's name and take the responsibility upon myself he asked my master's name he said william johnson the names were put down i think mr johnson and slave the captain said it's all right now mr johnson he thanked him kindly and the young officer begged my master to go with him and have something to drink and a cigar but as he had not acquired these accomplishments he excused himself and we went on board and came off to wilmington north carolina when the gentleman finds out his mistake he will i have no doubt be careful in future not to pretend to have an intimate acquaintance with an entire stranger during the voyage the captain said it was rather sharp shooting this morning mr johnson it was not out of any disrespect to you sir but they make it a rule to be very strict at charleston i have known families to be detained there with their slaves till reliable information could be received respecting them if they were not very careful any damned abolitionist might take off a lot of valuable niggers my master said i suppose so and thanked him again for helping him over the difficulty end of section eight section nine of running a thousand miles for freedom by ellen and william craft this librivox recording is in the public domain part one segment h we reached wilmington the next morning and took the train for richmond virginia i have stated that the american railway carriages or cars as they are called are constructed differently to those in england at one end of some of them in the south there is a little apartment with a couch on both sides for the convenience of families and invalids and as they thought my master was very poorly he was allowed to enter one of these apartments at petersburg virginia where an old gentleman and two handsome young ladies his daughters also got in and took seats in the same carriage but before the train started the gentleman stepped into my car and questioned me respecting my master he wished to know what was the matter with him where he was from and where he was going i told him where he came from and said that he was suffering from a complication of complaints and was going to philadelphia where he thought he could get more suitable advice than in georgia the gentleman said my master could obtain the very best advice in philadelphia which turned out to be quite correct though he did not receive it from physicians but from kind abolitionists who understood his case much better the gentleman also said i reckon your master's father hasn't any more such faithful and smart boys as you oh yes sir he has i replied lots on em which was literally true this seemed all he wished to know he thanked me gave me a ten-cent piece and requested me to be attentive to my good master i promised that i would do so and have ever since endeavoured to keep my pledge during the gentleman's absence the ladies and my master had a little cosy chat but on his return he said you seem to be very much afflicted sir yes sir replied the gentleman in the poultices what seems to be the matter with you sir may i be allowed to ask 
inflammatory rheumatism sir oh that is very bad sir said the kind gentleman i can sympathize with you for i know from bitter experience what the rheumatism is if he did he knew a good deal more than mr johnson the gentleman thought my master would feel better if he would lie down and rest himself and as he was anxious to avoid conversation he at once acted upon this suggestion the ladies politely rose took their extra shawls and made a nice pillow for the invalid's head my master wore a fashionable cloth cloak which they took and covered him comfortably on the couch after he had been lying a little while the ladies i suppose thought he was asleep so one of them gave a long sigh and said in a quiet fascinating tone papa he seems to be a very nice young gentleman but before papa could speak the other lady quickly said oh dear me i never felt so much for a gentleman in my life to use an american expression they fell in love with the wrong chap after my master had been lying a little while he got up the gentleman assisted him in getting on his cloak the ladies took their shawls and soon all were seated they then insisted upon mr johnson taking some of their refreshments which of course he did out of courtesy to the ladies all went on enjoying themselves until they reached richmond where the ladies and their father left the train but before doing so the good old virginian gentleman who appeared to be much pleased with my master presented him with a recipe which he said was a perfect cure for the inflammatory rheumatism but the invalid not being able to read it and fearing he should hold it upside down in pretending to do so thanked the donor kindly and placed it in his waistcoat pocket my master's new friend also gave him his card and requested him the next time he travelled that way to do him the kindness to call adding i shall be pleased to see you and so will my daughters mr johnson expressed his gratitude for the proffered hospitality and said he should feel glad to call on his return i have not the slightest doubt that he will fulfil the promise whenever that return takes place after changing trains we went on a little beyond fredericksburg and took a steamer to washington at richmond a stout elderly lady whose whole demeanour indicated that she belonged as mrs stowe's aunt chloe expresses it to one of the firstest families stepped into the carriage and took a seat near my master seeing me passing quickly along the platform she sprang up as if taken by a fit and exclaimed bless my soul there goes my nigger ned my master said no that is my boy the lady paid no attention to this she poked her head out of the window and bawled to me you ned come to me sir you runaway rascal on my looking round she drew her head in and said to my master i beg your pardon sir i was sure it was my nigger i never in my life saw two black pigs more alike than your boy and my ned after the disappointed lady had resumed her seat and the train had moved off she closed her eyes slightly raising her hands and in a sanctified tone said to my master oh i hope sir your boy will not turn out to be so worthless as my ned has oh i was as kind to him as if he had been my own son oh sir it grieves me very much to think that after all i did for him he should go off without having any cause whatever when did he leave you asked mr johnson about eighteen months ago and i have never seen hair or hide of him since did he have a wife inquired a very respectable-looking young gentleman who was sitting near my master and opposite to the lady no sir not when he left though he did have one a little before that she was very unlike him 
she was as good and as faithful a nigger as any one need wish to have but poor thing she became so ill that she was unable to do much work so i thought it would be best to sell her to go to new orleans where the climate is nice and warm i suppose she was very glad to go south for the restoration of her health said the gentleman no she was not replied the lady for niggers never know what is best for them she took on a great deal about leaving ned and the little nigger but as she was so weakly i let her go was she good-looking asked the young passenger who was evidently not of the same opinion as the talkative lady and therefore wished her to tell all she knew yes she was very handsome and much whiter than i am and therefore will have no trouble in getting another husband i am sure i wish her well i asked the speculator who bought her to sell her to a good master poor thing she has my prayers and i know she prays for me she was a good christian and always used to pray for my soul it was through her earliest prayers continued the lady that i was first led to seek forgiveness of my sins before i was converted at the great camp meeting this caused the lady to snuffle and to draw from her pocket a richly embroidered handkerchief and apply it to the corner of her eyes but my master could not see that it was at all soiled the silence which prevailed for a few moments was broken by the gentleman's saying as your july was such a very good girl and had served you so faithfully before she lost her health don't you think it would have been better to have emancipated her no indeed i do not scornfully exclaimed the lady as she impatiently crammed the fine handkerchief into a little work-bag i have no patience with people who set niggers at liberty it is the very worst thing you can do for them my dear husband just before he died willed all his niggers free but i and our friends knew very well that he was too good a man to have ever thought of doing such an unkind and foolish thing had he been in his right mind and therefore we had the will altered as it should have been in the first place do you mean madam asked my master that willing the slaves free was unjust to yourself or unkind to them i mean that it was decidedly unkind to the servants themselves it always seems to me such a cruel thing to turn niggers loose to shift for themselves when there are so many good masters to take care of them as for myself continued the considerate lady i thank the lord my dear husband left me and my son well provided for therefore i care nothing for the niggers on my own account for they are a great deal more trouble than they are worth i sometimes wish that there was not one of them in the world for the ungrateful wretches are always running away i have lost no less than ten since my poor husband died it's ruinous sir but as you are well provided for i suppose you do not feel the loss very much said the passenger i don't feel it at all haughtily continued the good soul but that is no reason why property should be squandered if my son and myself had the money for those valuable niggers just see what a great deal of good we could do for the poor and in sending missionaries abroad to the poor heathen who have never heard the name of our blessed redeemer my dear son who is a good christian minister has advised me not to worry and send my soul to hell for the sake of niggers but to sell every blessed one of them for what they will fetch and go and live in peace with him in new york this i have concluded to do i have just been to richmond and made arrangements with my agent to make clean work of the forty that are left your son being a good christian minister said the gentleman it's strange he did not advise you to let the poor negroes have their liberty and go north it's not at all strange sir it's not at all strange my son knows what's best for the niggers 
he has always told me that they were much better off than the free niggers in the north in fact i don't believe there are any white labouring people in the world who are as well off as the slaves you are quite mistaken madam said the young man for instance my own widowed mother before she died emancipated all her slaves and sent them to ohio where they are getting along well i saw several of them last summer myself well replied the lady freedom may do for your ma's niggers but it will never do for mine and plague them they shall never have it that is the word with the bark on it if freedom will not do for your slaves replied the passenger i have no doubt your ned and the other nine negroes will find out their mistake and return to their old home blast them exclaimed the old lady with great emphasis if i ever get them i will cook their infernal hash and tan their accursed black hides well for them god forgive me added the old soul the niggers will make me lose all my religion by this time the lady had reached her destination the gentleman got out at the next station beyond as soon as she was gone the young southerner said to my master what a damned shame it is for that old whining hypocritical humbug to cheat the poor negroes out of their liberty if she has religion may the devil prevent me from ever being converted End of section 9section ten of running a thousand miles for freedom by ellen and william craft this librivox recording is in the public domain part one segment i for the purpose of somewhat disguising myself i bought and wore a very good second-hand white beaver an article which i had never indulged in before so just before we arrived at washington an uncouth planter who had been watching me very closely said to my master i reckon stranger you are spoiling that ere nigger of yourn by letting him wear such a devilish fine hat just look at the quality on it the president couldn't wear a better i should just like to go and kick it overboard his friend touched him and said don't speak so to a gentleman why not exclaimed the fellow he grated his short teeth, which appeared to be nearly worn away by the incessant chewing of tobacco, and said, It always makes me itch all over from head to toe to get hold of every damned nigger I see dressed like a white man. Washington is run away with spoiled and free niggers. If I had my way, I would sell every damned rascal of em way down south, where the devil would be whipped out on em this man's fierce manner made my master feel rather nervous and therefore he thought the less he said the better so he walked off without making any reply in a few minutes we were landed at washington where we took a conveyance and hurried off to the train for baltimore we left our cottage on wednesday morning the twenty first of december eighteen forty eight and arrived at baltimore saturday evening the twenty fourth christmas eve baltimore was the last slave port of any note at which we stopped on arriving there we felt more anxious than ever because we knew not what that last dark night would bring it is true we were near the goal but our poor hearts were still as if tossed at sea and as there was another great and dangerous bar to pass we were afraid our liberties would be wrecked and like the ill-fated royal charter go down for ever just off the place we longed to reach they are particularly watchful at baltimore to prevent slaves from escaping into pennsylvania which is a free state after i had seen my master into one of the best carriages and was just about to step into mine an officer a full-blooded yankee of the lower order saw me he came quickly up and tapping me on the shoulder said in his unmistakable native twang 
together with no little display of his authority. Where are you going, boy? To Philadelphia, sir, I humbly replied. Well, what are you going there for? I am travelling with my master, who is in the next carriage, sir. Well, I calculate you had better get him out, and be mighty quick about it, because the train will soon be starting. It is against my rules to let any man take a slave past here, unless he can satisfy them in the office that he has a right to take him along. The officer then passed on and left me standing upon the platform, with my anxious heart apparently palpitating in the throat. At first I scarcely knew which way to turn, but it soon occurred to me that the good God, who had been with us thus far, would not forsake us at the eleventh hour. So, with renewed hope, I stepped into my master's carriage to inform him of the difficulty. I found him sitting at the farther end, quite alone. As soon as he looked up and saw me, he smiled. I also tried to wear a cheerful countenance in order to break the shock of the sad news. I knew what made him smile. He was aware that if we were fortunate we should reach our destination at five o'clock the next morning, and this made it the more painful to communicate what the officer had said. But, as there was no time to lose, I went up to him and asked him how he felt. He said, much better, and that he thanked God we were getting on so nicely. I then said we were not getting on quite so well as we had anticipated. He anxiously and quickly asked what was the matter. I told him. He started as if struck by lightning and exclaimed, Good heavens! William, is it possible that we are, after all, doomed to hopeless bondage? I could say nothing. My heart was too full to speak, for at first I did not know what to do. However, we knew it would never do to turn back to the City of Destruction, like Bunyan's Mistrust and Timorous, because they saw lions in the narrow way, after ascending the hill difficulty but press on, like noble Christian and hopeful, to the great city in which dwelt a few shining ones. So, after a few moments, I did all I could to encourage my companion, and we stepped out and made for the office. But how or where my master obtained sufficient courage to face the tyrants who had the power to blast all we held dear, heaven only knows. Queen Elizabeth could not have been more terror-stricken on being forced to land at the traitor's gate leading to the tower than we were on entering that office. We felt that our very existence was at stake, and that we must either sink or swim. But, as God was our present and mighty helper in this as well as in all former trials, we were able to keep our heads up and press forwards. On entering the room we found the principal man, to whom my master said, Do you wish to see me, sir? Yes, said this eagle-eyed officer, and he added, It is against our rules, sir, to allow any person to take a slave out of Baltimore into Philadelphia, unless he can satisfy us that he has a right to take him along. Why is that? asked my master, with more firmness than could be expected. Because, sir, continued he, in a voice and manner that almost chilled our blood, if we should suffer any gentleman to take a slave past here into Philadelphia, and should the gentleman with whom the slave might be travelling turn out not to be his rightful owner, and should the proper master come and prove that his slave escaped on our road, we shall have him to pay for, and, therefore, we cannot let any slave pass here without receiving security to show, and to satisfy us, that it is all right. This conversation attracted the attention of the large number of bustling passengers. After the officer had finished, a few of them said, Chit, chit, chit not because they thought we were slaves endeavouring to escape, 
but merely because they thought my master was a slaveholder, an invalid gentleman, and therefore it was wrong to detain him. The officer, observing that the passengers sympathised with my master, asked him if he was not acquainted with some gentleman in Baltimore that he could get to endorse for him, to show that I was his property, and that he had a right to take me off. He said, no, and added, I bought tickets in Charleston to pass us through to Philadelphia, and therefore you have no right to detain us here. Well, sir, said the man indignantly, right or no right, we shan't let you go. These sharp words fell upon our anxious hearts like the crack of doom, and made us feel that hope only smiles to deceive. For a few moments perfect silence prevailed. My master looked at me, and I at him, but neither of us dared to speak a word, for fear of making some blunder that would tend to our detection. We knew that the officers had power to throw us into prison, and if they had done so, we must have been detected and driven back, like the vilest felons, to a life of slavery, which we dreaded far more than sudden death. We felt as though we had come into deep waters and were about being overwhelmed, and that the slightest mistake would clip asunder the last brittle thread of hope by which we were suspended and let us down for ever into the dark and horrible pit of misery and degradation, from which we were straining every nerve to escape. While our hearts were crying lustily unto him who is ever ready and able to save, the conductor of the train that we had just left stepped in. The officer asked if we came by the train with him from Washington. He said we did, and left the room. Just then the bell rang for the train to leave, and had it been the sudden shock of an earthquake, it could not have given us a greater thrill. The sound of the bell caused every eye to flash with apparent interest, and to be more steadily fixed upon us than before. But, as God would have it, the officer all at once thrust his fingers through his hair, and in a state of great agitation said, I really don't know what to do. I calculate it is all right. He then told the clerk to run and tell the conductor to let this gentleman and slave pass, adding, as he is not well, it is a pity to stop him here. We will let him go. My master thanked him and stepped out and hobbled across the platform as quickly as possible. I tumbled him unceremoniously into one of the best carriages and leaped into mine just as the train was gliding off towards our happy destination. We thought of this plan about four days before we left Macon, and as we had our daily employment to attend to, we only saw each other at night. So we sat up the four long nights, talking over the plan and making preparations. We had also been four days on the journey, and as we travelled night and day, we got but very limited opportunities for sleeping. I believe nothing in the world could have kept us awake so long but the intense excitement, produced by the fear of being retaken on the one hand, and the bright anticipation of liberty on the other. End of section 10「Section 11 of Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom » by Ellen and William Craft. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1. Segment J We left Baltimore about eight o'clock in the evening, and, not being aware of any stopping place of any consequence between there and Philadelphia, and also knowing that if we were fortunate, we should be in the latter place early the next morning. I thought I might indulge in a few minutes sleep in the car, but I, like Bunyan's Christian in the arbour, went to sleep at the wrong time and took too long a nap. So, when the train reached Haver de Grace, all the first-class passengers had to get out of the carriages and into a ferry-boat to be ferried across the Susquehanna River 
and take the train on the opposite side the road was constructed so as to be raised or lowered to suit the tide so they rolled the luggage vans on to the boat and off on the other side and as i was in one of the apartments adjoining a baggage car they considered it unnecessary to awaken me and tumbled me over with the luggage but when my master was asked to leave his seat he found it very dark and cold and raining he missed me for the first time on the journey on all previous occasions as soon as the train stopped i was at hand to assist him this caused many slaveholders to praise me very much they said they had never before seen a slave so attentive to his master and therefore my absence filled him with terror and confusion the children of israel could not have felt more troubled on arriving at the red sea so he asked the conductor if he had seen anything of his slave the man being somewhat of an abolitionist and believing that my master was really a slaveholder thought he would tease him a little respecting me so he said no sir i haven't seen anything of him for some time i have no doubt he has run away and is in philadelphia free long before now my master knew that there was nothing in this so he asked the conductor if he would please to see if he could find me the man indignantly replied i am no slave hunter and as far as i am concerned everybody must look after their own niggers he went off and left the confused invalid to fancy whatever he felt inclined my master at first thought i must have been kidnapped into slavery by some one or left or perhaps killed on the train he also thought of stopping to see if he could hear anything of me but he soon remembered that he had no money that night all the money we had was consigned to my own pocket because we thought in case there were any pickpockets about a slave's pocket would be the last one they would look for however hoping to meet me some day in a land of liberty and as he had the tickets he thought it best upon the whole to enter the boat and come off to philadelphia and endeavour to make his way alone in this cold and hollow world as best he could the time was now up so he went on board and came across with feelings that can be better imagined than described after the train had got fairly on the way to philadelphia the guard came into my car and gave me a violent shake and bawled out at the same time boy wake up i started almost frightened out of my wits he said your master is scared half to death about you that frightened me still more i thought they had found him out so i anxiously inquired what was the matter the god said he thinks you have run away from him this made me feel quite at ease i said no sir i am satisfied my good master doesn't think that so off i started to see him he had been fearfully nervous but on seeing me he at once felt much better he merely wished to know what had become of me on returning to my seat i found the conductor and two or three other persons amusing themselves very much respecting my running away so the god said boy what did your master want Footnote i may state here that every man-slave is called boy till he is very old then the more respectable slaveholders call him uncle the women are all girls till they are aged then they are called aunts this is the reason why mrs stowe calls her characters uncle tom aunt chloe uncle tiff etc End of footnote. i replied he merely wished to know what had become of me no said the man that was not it he thought you had taken french leave for parts unknown i never saw a fellow so badly scared about losing his slave in my life now continued the god let me give you a little friendly advice when you get to philadelphia run away and leave that cripple and have your liberty no sir 
i indifferently replied i can't promise to do that why not said the conductor evidently much surprised don't you want your liberty yes sir i replied but i shall never run away from such a good master as i have at present one of the men said to the guard let him alone i guess he will open his eyes when he gets to philadelphia and see things in another light after giving me a good deal of information which i afterwards found to be very useful they left me alone i also met with a coloured gentleman on this train who recommended me to a boarding-house that was kept by an abolitionist where he thought i would be quite safe if i wished to run away from my master i thanked him kindly but of course did not let him know who we were late at night or rather early in the morning i heard a fearful whistling of the steam-engine so i opened the window and looked out and saw a large number of flickering lights in the distance and heard a passenger in the next carriage who also had his head out of the window say to his companion wake up old horse we are at philadelphia the sight of those lights and that announcement made me feel almost as happy as bunyan's christian must have felt when he first caught sight of the cross i like him felt that the straps that bound the heavy burden to my back began to pop and the load to roll off i also looked and looked again for it appeared very wonderful to me how the mere sight of our first city of refuge should have all at once made my hitherto sad and heavy heart become so light and happy as the train speeded on i rejoiced and thanked god with all my heart and soul for his great kindness and tender mercy in watching over us and bringing us safely through as soon as the train had reached the platform before it had fairly stopped i hurried out of my carriage to my master whom i got at once into a cab placed the luggage on jumped in myself and we drove off to the boarding-house which was so kindly recommended to me on leaving the station my master or rather my wife as i may now say who had from the commencement of the journey borne up in a manner that much surprised us both grasped me by the hand and said thank god william we are safe then burst into tears leant upon me and wept like a child the reaction was fearful so when we reached the house she was in reality so weak and faint that she could scarcely stand alone however i got her into the apartments that were pointed out and there we knelt down on this sabbath and christmas day a day that will ever be memorable to us and poured out our heartfelt gratitude to god for his goodness in enabling us to overcome so many perilous difficulties in escaping out of the jaws of the wicked end of section 11section twelve of running a thousand miles for freedom by ellen and william craft this librivox recording is in the public domain part two segment a after my wife had a little recovered herself she threw off the disguise and assumed her own apparel we then stepped into the sitting-room and asked to see the landlord the man came in but he seemed thunderstruck on finding a fugitive slave and his wife instead of a young cotton planter and his nigger as his eyes travelled round the room he said to me where is your master i pointed him out the man gravely replied i am not joking i really wish to see your master i pointed him out again but at first he could not believe his eyes he said he knew that was not the gentleman that came with me 
but after some conversation we satisfied him that we were fugitive slaves and had just escaped in the manner i have described we asked him if he thought it would be safe for us to stop in philadelphia he said he thought not but he would call in some persons who knew more about the laws than himself he then went out and kindly brought in several of the leading abolitionists of the city who gave us a most hearty and friendly welcome amongst them as it was in december and also as we had just left a very warm climate they advised us not to go to canada as we had intended but to settle at boston in the united states it is true that the constitution of the republic has always guaranteed the slaveholders the right to come into any of the so-called free states and take their fugitives back to southern egypt but through the untiring uncompromising and manly efforts of mr garrison wendell phillips theodore parker and a host of other noble abolitionists of boston and the neighborhood public opinion in massachusetts had become so opposed to slavery and to kidnapping that it was almost impossible for any one to take a fugitive slave out of that state so we took the advice of our good philadelphia friends and settled at boston i shall have something to say about our sojourn there presently among other friends we met with at philadelphia was robert purves esq a well-educated and wealthy coloured gentleman who introduced us to mr barclay ivans a member of the society of friends and a noble and generous-hearted farmer who lived at some distance in the country this good samaritan at once invited us to go and stop quietly with his family till my wife could somewhat recover from the fearful reaction of the past journey we most gratefully accepted the invitation and at the time appointed we took a steamer to a place up the delaware river where our new and dear friend met us with his snug little cart and took us to his happy home this was the first act of great and disinterested kindness we had ever received from a white person the gentleman was not of the fairest complexion and therefore as my wife was not in the room when i received the information respecting him and his anti-slavery character she thought of course he was a quadroon like herself but on arriving at the house and finding out her mistake she became more nervous and timid than ever as the cart came into the yard the dear good old lady and her three charming and affectionate daughters all came to the door to meet us we got out and the gentleman said go in and make yourselves at home i will see after the baggage but my wife was afraid to approach them she stopped in the yard and said to me william i thought we were coming among colored people i replied it is all right these are the same no she said it is not all right and i am not going to stop here i have no confidence whatever in white people they are only trying to get us back to slavery she turned round and said i am going right off the old lady then came out with her sweet soft and winning smile shook her heartily by the hand and kindly said how art thou my dear we are all very glad to see thee and thy husband come in to the fire i dare say thou art cold and hungry after thy journey we went in and the young ladies asked if she would like to go upstairs and fix herself before tea my wife said no i thank you i shall only stop a little while but where art thou going this cold night said mr ivans who had just stepped in i don't know was the reply well then he continued i think thou hadst better take off thy things and sit near the fire tea will soon be ready yes come ellen said mrs ivans let me assist thee as she commenced undoing my wife's bonnet strings don't be frightened ellen i shall not hurt a hair of thy head 
we have heard with much pleasure of the marvellous escape of thee and thy husband and deeply sympathize with thee in all that thou hast undergone i don't wonder at thee poor thing being timid but thou needs not fear us we would as soon send one of our own daughters into slavery as thee so thou mayest make thyself quite at ease these soft and soothing words fell like balm upon my wife's unstrung nerves and melted her to tears her fears and prejudices vanished and from that day she has firmly believed that there are good and bad persons of every shade of complexion after seeing sally ann and jacob two coloured domestics my wife felt quite at home after partaking of what mrs stowe's mose and peat called a busting supper the ladies wished to know whether we could read on learning we could not they said if we liked they would teach us to this kind offer of course there was no objection but we looked rather knowingly at each other as much as to say that they would have rather a hard task to cram anything into our thick and matured skulls however all hands set to and quickly cleared away the tea things and the ladies and their good brother brought out the spelling and copy books and slates etc and commenced with their new and green pupils we had by stratagem learned the alphabet while in slavery but not the writing characters and as we had been such a time learning so little we at first felt that it was a waste of time for any one at our ages to undertake to learn to read and write but as the ladies were so anxious that we should learn and so willing to teach us we concluded to give our whole minds to the work and see what could be done by so doing at the end of the three weeks we remained with the good family we could spell and write our names quite legibly they all begged us to stop longer but as we were not safe in the state of pennsylvania and also as we wished to commence doing something for a livelihood we did not remain when the time arrived for us to leave for boston it was like parting with our relatives we have since met with many very kind and hospitable friends both in america and england but we have never been under a roof where we were made to feel more at home or where the inmates took a deeper interest in our well-being than mr barclay ivans and his dear family may god ever bless them and preserve each one from every reverse of fortune we finally as i have stated settled at boston where we remained nearly two years i employed as cabinet maker and furniture broker and my wife at her needle and as our little earnings in slavery were not all spent on the journey we were getting on very well and would have made money if we had not been compelled by the general government at the bidding of the slaveholders to break up business and fly from under the stars and stripes to save our liberties and our lives in eighteen fifty congress passed the fugitive slave bill an enactment too infamous to have been thought of or tolerated by any people in the world except the unprincipled and tyrannical yankees the following are a few of the leading features of the above law which requires under heavy penalties that the inhabitants of the free states should not only refuse food and shelter to a starving hunted human being but should also assist if called upon by the authorities to seize the unhappy fugitive and send him back to slavery in no case is a person's evidence admitted in court in defence of his liberty when arrested under this law if the judge decides that the prisoner is a slave he gets ten dollars but if he sets him at liberty he only receives five after the prisoner has been sentenced to slavery he is handed over to the united states marshal who has the power at the expense of the general government 
to summon a sufficient force to take the poor creature back to slavery and to the lash from which he fled our old masters sent agents to boston after us they took out warrants and placed them in the hands of the united states marshal to execute but the following letter from our highly esteemed and faithful friend the rev samuel may of boston to our equally dear and much lamented friend dr estlin of bristol will show why we were not taken into custody End of section twelve. Section thirteen of Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom by Ellen and William Craft. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part two, segment B. Twenty one, Cornhill, Boston, November sixth, eighteen fifty. My dear Mr. Estlin, I trust that in God's good providence this letter will be handed to you in safety by our good friends, William and Ellen Craft. They have lived amongst us about two years, and have proved themselves worthy, in all respects, of our confidence and regard. The laws of this republican and Christian land, tell it not in Moscow nor in Constantinople, regard them only as slaves chattels personal property but they nobly vindicated their title and right to freedom two years since by winning their way to it at least so they thought but now the slave power with the aid of daniel webster and a band of lesser traitors has enacted a law which puts their dearly bought liberties in the most imminent peril holds out a strong temptation to every mercenary and unprincipled ruffian to become their kidnapper and has stimulated the slaveholders generally to such desperate acts for the recovery of their fugitive property as have never before been enacted in the history of this government within a fortnight two fellows from macon georgia have been in boston for the purpose of arresting our friends william and ellen a writ was served against them from the united states district court but it was not served by the united states marshal why not is not certainly known perhaps through fear for a general feeling of indignation and a cool determination not to allow this young couple to be taken from boston into slavery was aroused and pervaded the city it is understood that one of the judges told the marshal that he would not be authorized in breaking the door of Kraft's house. Kraft kept himself close within the house, armed himself, and awaited with remarkable composure the event. Ellen, in the meantime, had been taken to a retired place out of the city. The vigilance committee, appointed at a late meeting in Faneuil Hall, enlarged their numbers held an almost permanent session and appointed various subcommittees to act in different ways one of these committees called repeatedly on messrs hughes and knight the slave catchers and requested and advised them to leave the city at first they peremptorily refused to do so till they got hold of the niggers on complaint of different persons these two fellows were several times arrested carried before one of our county courts and held to bail on charges of conspiracy to kidnap and of defamation in calling william and ellen slaves at length they became so alarmed that they left the city by an indirect route evading the vigilance of many persons who were on the lookout for them hughes at one time was near losing his life at the hands of an infuriated coloured man while these men remained in the city a prominent whig gentleman sent word to william craft that if he would submit peaceably to an arrest he and his wife should be bought from their owners cost what it might craft replied in effect that he was in a measure the representative of all the other fugitives in boston 
some two hundred or three hundred in number that if he gave up they would all be at the mercy of the slave-catchers and must fly from the city at any sacrifice and that if his freedom could be bought for two cents he would not consent to compromise the matter in such a way this event has stirred up the slave spirit of the country south and north the united states government is determined to try its hand in enforcing the fugitive slave law and william and ellen craft would be prominent objects of the slaveholders vengeance under these circumstances it is the almost unanimous opinion of their best friends that they should quit america as speedily as possible and seek an asylum in england oh shame shame upon us that americans whose fathers fought against great britain in order to be free should have to acknowledge this disgraceful fact god gave us a fair and goodly heritage in this land but man has cursed it with his devices and crimes against human souls and human rights is america the land of the free and the home of the brave god knows it is not and we know it too a brave young man and a virtuous young woman must fly the american shores and seek under the shadow of the british throne the enjoyment of life liberty and the pursuit of happiness but i must pursue my plain sad story all day long i have been busy planning a safe way for william and ellen to leave boston we dare not allow them to go on board a vessel even in the port of boston for the writ is yet in the marshal's hands and he may be waiting an opportunity to serve it so i am expecting to accompany them to-morrow to portland maine which is beyond the reach of the marshal's authority and there i hope to see them on board a british steamer this letter is written to introduce them to you i know your infirm health but i am sure if you were stretched on your bed in your last illness and could lift your hand at all you would extend it to welcome these poor hunted fellow-creatures henceforth england is their nation and their home it is with real regret for our personal loss in their departure as well as burning shame for the land that is not worthy of them that we send them away or rather allow them to go but with all the resolute courage they have shown in a most trying hour they themselves see it is the part of a foolhardy rashness to attempt to stay here longer i must close and with many renewed thanks for all your kind words and deeds towards us i am very respectfully yours samuel may jr our old masters having heard how their agents were treated at boston wrote to mr fillmore who was then president of the united states to know what he could do to have us sent back to slavery mr fillmore said that we should be returned he gave instruction for military force to be sent to boston to assist the officers in making the arrest therefore we as well as our friends among whom was george thompson esq late m p for the tower hamlets the slave's long-tried self-sacrificing friend and eloquent advocate thought it best at any sacrifice to leave the mock free republic and come to a country where we and our dear little ones can be truly free no one daring to molest or make us afraid but as the officers were watching every vessel that left the port to prevent us from escaping we had to take the expensive and tedious overland route to halifax we shall always cherish the deepest feelings of gratitude to the vigilance committee of boston upon which were many of the leading abolitionists and also to our numerous friends for the very kind and noble manner in which they assisted us to preserve our liberties and to escape from boston as it were like lot from sodom 
to a place of refuge and finally to this truly free and glorious country where no tyrant let his power be ever so absolute over his poor trembling victims at home dare come and lay hands upon us or upon our dear little boys who had the good fortune to be born upon british soil and reduce us to the legal level of the beast that perisheth oh may god bless the thousands of unflinching disinterested abolitionists of america who were labouring through evil as well as through good report to cleanse their country's escutcheon from the foul and destructive blot of slavery and to restore to every bondman his god-given rights and may god ever smile upon england and upon england's good much beloved and deservedly honoured queen for the generous protection that is given to unfortunate refugees of every rank and of every colour and clime on the passing of the fugitive slave bill the following learned doctors as well as a host of lesser traitors came out strongly in its defence the rev dr gardner spring an eminent presbyterian clergyman of new york well known in this country by his religious publications declared from the pulpit that if by one prayer he could liberate every slave in the world he would not dare to offer it the rev dr joel parker of philadelphia in the course of a discussion on the nature of slavery says what then are the evils inseparable from slavery there is not one that is not equally inseparable from depraved human nature in other lawful relations the rev moses stuart doctor of divinity late professor in the theological college of andover in his vindication of this bill reminds his readers that many southern slaveholders are true christians that sending back a fugitive to them is not like restoring one to an idolatrous people that though we may pity the fugitive yet the mosaic law does not authorize the rejection of the claims of the slaveholders to their stolen or strayed property the rev dr spencer of brooklyn new york has come forward in support of the fugitive slave bill by publishing a sermon entitled the religious duty of obedience to the laws which has elicited the highest encomiums from dr samuel h cox the presbyterian minister of brooklyn notorious both in this country and america for his sympathy with the slaveholder the rev w m rogers an orthodox minister of boston delivered a sermon in which he says when the slave asks me to stand between him and his master what does he ask he asks me to murder a nation's life and i will not do it because i have a conscience because there is a god he proceeds to affirm that if resistance to the carrying out of the fugitive slave law should lead the magistracy to call the citizens to arms their duty was to obey and if ordered to take human life in the name of god to take it and he concludes by admonishing the fugitives to hearken to the word of god and to count their own masters worthy of all honour the rev william crowell of waterfield state of maine printed a thanksgiving sermon of the same kind in which he calls upon his hearers not to allow excessive sympathies for a few hundred fugitives to blind them so as that they may risk increased suffering to the millions already in chains the rev dr taylor an episcopal clergyman of new haven connecticut made a speech at a union meeting in which he deprecates the agitation on the law and urges obedience to it asking is that article in the constitution contrary to the law of nature or nations or to the will of god is it so is there a shadow of reason for saying it i have not been able to discover it have i not shown you it is lawful to deliver up in compliance with the laws fugitive slaves for the high the great 
the momentous interests of those southern states the right reverend bishop hopkins of vermont in a lecture at lockport says it was warranted by the old testament and inquires what effect had the gospel in doing away with slavery none whatever therefore he argues as it is expressly permitted by the bible it does not in itself involve any sin but that every christian is authorized by the divine law to own slaves provided they were not treated with unnecessary cruelty End of section 13section fourteen of running a thousand miles for freedom by ellen and william craft this librivox recording is in the public domain part two segment c the rev orville dewey doctor of divinity of the unitarian connection maintained in his lectures that the safety of the union is not to be hazarded for the sake of the african race he declares that, for his part, he would send his own brother or child into slavery, if needed to preserve the union between the free and the slaveholding states, and, counselling the slave to similar magnanimity, thus exhorts him. Your right to be free is not absolute, unqualified, irrespective of all consequences, if my espousal of your claim is likely to involve your race and mine together in disasters infinitely greater than your personal servitude then you ought not to be free in such a case personal rights ought to be sacrificed to the general good you yourself ought to see this and be willing to suffer for a while one for many if the doctor is prepared he is quite at liberty to sacrifice his personal rights to the general good but as i have suffered a long time in slavery it is hardly fair for the doctor to advise me to go back according to his showing he ought rather to take my place that would be practically carrying out his logic as respects suffering a while one for many in fact so eager were they to prostrate themselves before the great god of slavery and like balaam to curse instead of blessing the people whom god had brought out of bondage that they in bringing up obsolete passages from the old testament to justify their downward course overlooked or would not see the following verses which show very clearly according to the doctor's own textbook that the slaves have a right to run away and that it is unscriptural for any one to send them back in the twenty-third chapter of deuteronomy fifteenth and sixteenth verses it is thus written thou shalt not deliver unto his master the servant which is escaped from his master unto thee he shall dwell with thee even among you in that place which he shall choose in one of thy gates where it liketh him best thou shalt not oppress him hide the outcast bewray not him that wandereth let mine outcasts dwell with thee be thou a covert to them from the face of the spoiler isaiah chapter sixteen verses three and four the great majority of the american ministers are not content with uttering sentences similar to the above or remaining wholly indifferent to the cries of the poor bondman but they do all they can to blast the reputation and to muzzle the mouths of the few good men who dare to beseech the god of mercy to loose the bonds of wickedness to undo the heavy burdens and let the oppressed go free these reverend gentlemen pour a terrible cannonade upon jonah for refusing to carry god's message against nineveh and tell us about the whale in which he was entombed while they utterly overlook the existence of the whales which trouble their republican waters and know not that they themselves are the jonahs who threaten to sink their ship of state 
by steering in an unrighteous direction we are told that the whale vomited up the runaway prophet this would not have seemed so strange had it been one of the above lukewarm doctors of divinity whom he had swallowed for even a whale might find such a morsel difficult of digestion i venerate the man whose heart is warm whose hands are pure whose doctrines and whose life coincident exhibit lucid proof that he is honest in the sacred cause but grace abused brings forth the foulest deeds as richest soil the most luxuriant weeds i must now leave the reverend gentleman in the hands of him who knows best how to deal with a recreant ministry i do not wish it to be understood that all the ministers of the states are of the balaam stamp there are those who are as uncompromising with slaveholders as moses was with pharaoh and like daniel will never bow down before the great false god that has been set up on arriving at portland we found that the steamer we intended to take had run into a schooner the previous night and was lying up for repairs so we had to wait there in fearful suspense for two or three days during this time we had the honour of being the guest of the late and much lamented daniel oliver esq one of the best and most hospitable men in the state by simply fulfilling the scripture injunction to take in the stranger etc he ran the risk of incurring a penalty of two thousand dollars and twelve months imprisonment but neither the fugitive slave law nor any other satanic enactment can ever drive the spirit of liberty and humanity out of such noble and generous-hearted men may god ever bless his dear widow and eventually unite them in his courts above we finally got off to st john's new brunswick where we had to wait two days for the steamer that conveyed us to windsor nova scotia on going into a hotel at st john's we met the butler in the hall to whom i said we wish to stop here to-night he turned round scratching his head evidently much put about but thinking that my wife was white he replied we have plenty of room for the lady but i don't know about yourself we never take in coloured folks oh don't trouble about me i said if you have room for the lady that will do so please have the luggage taken to a bedroom which was immediately done and my wife went upstairs into the apartment after taking a little walk in the town i returned and asked to see the lady on being conducted to the little sitting-room where she then was i entered without knocking much to the surprise of the whole house the lady then rang the bell and ordered dinner for two dinner for two mum exclaimed the waiter as he backed out of the door yes for two said my wife in a little while the stout red-nosed butler whom we first met knocked at the door i called out come in on entering he rolled his whisky eyes at me and then at my wife and said in a very solemn tone did you order dinner for two mum yes for two my wife again replied this confused the chubby butler more than ever and as the landlord was not in the house he seemed at a loss what to do when dinner was ready the maid came in and said please mum the missus wishes to know whether you will have dinner up now or wait till your friend arrives i will have it up at once if you please thank you mum continued the maid and out she glided after a good deal of giggling in the passage some one said you are in for it butler after all so you had better make the best of a bad job but before the dinner was sent up the landlord returned and having heard from the steward of the steamer by which we came that we were bound for england the proprietor's native country he treated us in the most respectful manner at the above house the boots 
whose name i forget was a fugitive slave a very intelligent and active man about forty-five years of age soon after his marriage while in slavery his bride was sold away from him and he could never learn where the poor creature dwelt so after remaining single for many years both before and after his escape and never expecting to see again nor even to hear from his long-lost partner he finally married a woman at st john's but poor fellow as he was passing down the street one day he met a woman at the first glance they nearly recognized each other they both turned round and stared and unconsciously advanced till she screamed and flew into his arms her first words were dear are you married on his answering in the affirmative she shrank from his embrace hung her head and wept a person who witnessed this meeting told me it was most affecting this couple knew nothing of each other's escape or whereabouts the woman had escaped a few years before to the free states by secreting herself in the hold of a vessel but as they tried to get her back to bondage she fled to new brunswick for that protection which her native country was too mean to afford the man at once took his old wife to see his new one who was also a fugitive slave and as they all knew the workings of the infamous system of slavery they could as no one else can sympathize with each other's misfortune according to the rules of slavery the man and his first wife were already divorced but not morally and therefore it was arranged between the three that he should live only with the lastly married wife and allow the other one so much a week as long as she requested his assistance after staying at st john's two days the steamer arrived which took us to windsor where we found a coach bound for halifax prejudice against colour forced me on the top in the rain on arriving within about seven miles of the town the coach broke down and was upset i fell upon the big crotchety driver whose head stuck in the mud and as he always objected to niggers riding inside with white folks i was not particularly sorry to see him deeper in the mire than myself all of us were scratched and bruised more or less after the passengers had crawled out as best they could we all set off and paddled through the deep mud and cold and rain to halifax on leaving boston it was our intention to reach halifax at least two or three days before the steamer from boston touched there en route for liverpool but having been detained so long at portland and st john's we had the misfortune to arrive at halifax at dark just two hours after the steamer had gone consequently we had to wait there a fortnight for the cambria End of section 14section fifteen of running a thousand miles for freedom by ellen and william craft this librivox recording is in the public domain part two segment d the coach was patched up and reached halifax with the luggage soon after the passengers arrived the only respectable hotel that was then in the town had suspended business and was closed so we went to the inn opposite the market where the coach stopped a most miserable dirty hole it was knowing that we were still under the influence of the low yankee prejudice i sent my wife in with the other passengers to engage a bed for herself and husband i stopped outside in the rain till the coach came up if i had gone in and asked for a bed they would have been quite full but as they thought my wife was white she had no difficulty in securing apartments into which the luggage was afterwards carried the landlady observing that i took an interest in the baggage became somewhat uneasy and went into my wife's room and said to her do you know the dark man downstairs 
yes he is my husband oh i mean the black man the nigger i quite understand you he is my husband my god exclaimed the woman as she flounced out and banged to the door but as we were there and did not mean to leave that night we did not disturb ourselves on our ordering tea the landlady sent word back to say that we must take it in the kitchen or in our bedroom as she had no other room for niggers we replied that we were not particular and that they could send it up to our room which they did after the pro-slavery persons who were staying there heard that we were in the whole house became agitated and all sorts of oaths and fearful threats were heaped upon the damned niggers for coming among white folks some of them said they would not stop there a minute if there was another house to go to the mistress came up the next morning to know how long we wished to stop we said a fortnight oh dear me it is impossible for us to accommodate you and i think you had better go you must understand i have no prejudice myself i think a good deal of the coloured people and have always been their friend but if you stop here we shall lose all our customers which we can't do nohow we said we were glad to hear that she had no prejudice and was such a staunch friend to the coloured people we also informed her that we would be sorry for her customers to leave on our account and as it was not our intention to interfere with any one it was foolish for them to be frightened away however if she would get us a comfortable place we would be glad to leave the landlady said she would go out and try after spending the whole morning in canvassing the town she came to our room and said i have been from one end of the place to the other but everybody is full having a little foretaste of the vulgar prejudice of the town we did not wonder at the result however the landlady gave me the address of some respectable coloured families whom she thought under the circumstances might be induced to take us and as we were not at all comfortable being compelled to sit eat and sleep in the same small room we were quite willing to change our quarters i called upon the reverend mr kennedy a truly good-hearted christian man who received us at a word and both he and his kind lady treated us handsomely and for a nominal charge my wife and myself were both unwell when we left boston and having taken fresh cold on the journey to halifax we were laid up there under the doctor's care nearly the whole fortnight i had much worry about getting tickets for they baffled us shamefully at the cunard office they at first said that they did not book till the steamer came which was not the fact when i called again they said they knew the steamer would come full from boston and therefore we had better try to get to liverpool by other means other mean yankee excuses were made and it was not till an influential gentleman to whom mr francis jackson of boston kindly gave us a letter went and rebuked them that we were able to secure our tickets so when we went on board my wife was very poorly and was also so ill on the voyage that i did not believe she could live to see liverpool however i am thankful to say she arrived and after laying up at liverpool very ill for two or three weeks gradually recovered it was not until we stepped upon the shore at liverpool that we were free from every slavish fear we raised our thankful hearts to heaven and could have knelt down like the neapolitan exiles and kissed the soil for we felt that from slavery heaven sure had kept this spot of earth uncursed to show how all things were created first
in a few days after we landed the rev francis bishop and his lady came and invited us to be their guests to whose unlimited kindness and watchful care my wife owes in a great degree her restoration to health we enclosed our letter from the rev mr may to mr estlin who at once wrote to invite us to his house at bristol on arriving there both mr and miss estlin received us as cordially as did our first good quaker friends in pennsylvania it grieves me much to have to mention that he is no more every one who knew him can truthfully say peace to the memory of a man of worth a man of letters and of manners too of manners sweet as virtue always wears when gay good nature dresses her in smiles it was principally through the extreme kindness of mr estlin the right honourable lady noel byron miss harriet martineau mrs reed miss sturch and a few other good friends that my wife and myself were able to spend a short time at a school in this country to acquire a little of that education which we were so shamefully deprived of while in the house of bondage the school is under the supervision of the misses lushington daughters of the right honourable stephen lushington doctor of civil law during our stay at the school we received the greatest attention from every one and i am particularly indebted to thomas wilson esq of bradmore house chiswick who was then the master for the deep interest he took in trying to get me on in my studies we shall ever fondly and gratefully cherish the memory of our endeared and departed friend mr estlin we as well as the anti-slavery cause lost a good friend in him however if departed spirits in heaven are conscious of the wickedness of this world and are allowed to speak he will never fail to plead in the presence of the angelic host and before the great and just judge for downtrodden and outraged humanity therefore i cannot think thee wholly gone the better part of thee is with us still thy soul its hampering clay aside hath thrown and only freer wrestles with the ill thou livest in the life of all good things what words thou spakest for freedom shall not die thou sleepest not for now thy love hath wings to soar where hence thy hope could hardly fly and often from that other world on this some gleams from great souls gone before may shine to shed on struggling hearts a clearer bliss and clothe the right with lustre more divine farewell good man good angel now this hand soon like thine own shall lose its cunning too soon shall this soul like thine bewildered stand then leap to thread the free unfathomed blue james russell lowell in the preceding pages i have not dwelt upon the great barbarities which are practised upon the slaves because i wish to present the system in its mildest form and to show that the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel but i do now however most solemnly declare that a very large majority of the american slaves are overworked underfed and frequently unmercifully flogged i have often seen slaves tortured in every conceivable manner i have seen them hunted down and torn by bloodhounds i have seen them shamefully beaten and branded with hot irons i have seen them hunted and even burned alive at the stake frequently for offences that would be applauded if committed by white persons for similar purposes in short it is well known in england 
if not all over the world that the americans as a people are notoriously mean and cruel towards all coloured persons whether they are bond or free o oh, tyrant thou who sleepest on a volcano from whose pent-up wrath already some red flashes bursting up beware end of section fifteen and end of running a thousand miles for freedom by ellen and william craft thank you for listening